In this video, I just want to briefly explain why I am no longer a Christian. When I became a Christian uh, some years ago in my local Baptist church, not far from here, I became a born-again evangelical Christian. And I had a born-again experience. In fact, I can tell you the exact date, uh, the month and the year that I uh, said the Jesus prayer and I be became a born-again Christian. And uh, many wonderful things happened. I had many uh, extraordinary experiences of a kind of spiritual, even supernatural kind. And... Um, but um, that wasn't the end of the story, of course. And what happened? Well, you know, I developed a powerful relationship with God. I became aware of the universe as a, a, div a creation of God, a divine creation. The scriptures, the Holy Bible, the Old and New Testament became very um, important to me. And they came alive to me in that way that they do for Christians. But also a parallel process starts to happen. And this was the Achilles heel of my faith and it was almost from the beginning because I took a great interest in the Bible of course and read it avidly and um, and with an expectation that God would speak to me and uh, I felt that God did uh, on occasions and uh, that it would be relevant to my life and I applied the Bible to uh, many problems and uh, it was great but at the same time I couldn't help but notice various things various problem problems which i assumed at the time was the devil trying to undermine my trust in god's word hmm. and so i looked for solutions to these problems and the way i did it was to think about them uh, to, and to turn to biblical commentaries written by christians to help explain to me uh you know what the solution was and uh, and thus overcome the problems and move forward but it wasn't as simple as that. Yes, some of the problems did have solutions and I happily moved on. But others of them, I kind of dug myself into a deeper and deeper hole. And um, I discovered other problems because scholars would reference other issues. And I think, oh, my goodness me, I didn't know that was a problem. And that became an issue for me. Um, and as I said, I developed this parallel existence. On the one hand, I was a committed Christian. I believed Jesus was God. I believed in the Trinity, the incarnation, the atonement. I believed in the inerrancy of scripture. I was an evangelical, of course, Protestant, uh, conservative. And on the other hand, I was becoming aware through my own innocent reading of the New Testament, particularly of various big problems, which, as I said, like. I thought were spiritually um a spiritual in origin caused by the devil trying to undermine my faith i don't believe that anymore of course because these problems i was stumbling across are well known to biblical scholars and have been discussed by them for the last 150 200 years i just stumbled across issues which were well known in the world of biblical studies examples um, and of course unless there's some kind of massive satanic conspiracy you know in all the universities and seminaries in the world um you know this is these are real issues and i think of course they are real issues um what are they well there's a number of them uh, i'll just give you a, a couple of uh, examples and oh, i'm good. going to read from a, a book by a leading um church of england priest a biblical scholar and dean of king's college here in london professor of biblical interpretation a very respected um scholar um, and he discusses uh, some of these issues in a very concise and helpful way just to share with you uh, what happened to me uh, when I also wrestled with these issues. And it led me ultimately to part company with many, not all, many of the fundamental teachings of Christianity, because I still believe a lot of Christianity is true. Um, uh, obviously, a belief in one God, belief in uh, the creation, the created order, that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God, the prophets, I believe, the day of judgment, I believe in angels and demons and, and the resurrection of the dead. And so the list is very long, actually. It's like a huge iceberg under the water. There's so much I still just accept as there. It's just a little bit on top, principally to do with things like incarnation, trinity and atonement, which... I can no longer accept for historical and philosophical and theological reasons. So what were some of the issues? Well, I stumbled across, much to my horror in a way, uh, through my reading of the New Testament, the clear impression that many people, including Jesus, including Paul, James, John and others, 
expected the end of the world soon, very soon, imminently, within the lifetime of people then living. And um, I looked into this and tried to find a way to uh, reconcile this with the rather obvious fact that we are living 2,000 years later and the end hasn't come any time soon. And there's a prospect of endless millennia ahead. How can this be the case? There seems to be a mistake here made by Jesus and Paul and James and John, etc. Um, and the more I looked into this problem, it's called, uh, technically it's called eschatology uh, or the imminent parousia the more I realized that in fact there was a mistake, at least according to the scriptures uh, of the New Testament, that uh, uh, the way they spoke, Jesus is made to have made a mistake and Paul clearly makes a mistake. Now, these are not uh, moral errors. They're not bad people because they made a mistake. Paul expected the end of the world. You know, he was wrong. He is a human being. He was wrong about many things, in fact. Um, so that was one uh, serious issue. The other serious issue, which is kind of connected, is uh, the Gospels. Um, I discovered, and this is something that I didn't stumble across in my reading of the New Testament, but I learned and discovered through reading scholarship, biblical scholars. I discovered that the, the Gospel of John is seen as much less historical than the other three Gospels. And that's a real shame because the Gospel of John has some of the juiciest, most robust, most clear statements of Jesus' divinity anywhere in the New Testament, where Jesus says, according to John, I am the light of the world, or before Abraham was, I am, or I am the resurrection and the life, etc., etc. Now, all of these wonderful statements are only found in one Gospel, the very last to be written. They're not found anywhere else. And um, scholars are pretty unanimous with one or two exceptions across the whole world, the leading scholars, including Christian, most, most scholars are Christians, that Jesus, the actual historical Jesus 2,000 years ago, didn't say these things. And the reasons why are historical and, and textual and theological. I'm not going to go into them, but the fact is that is the case. And I was shocked to discover that was the case. Now, what did that mean to me? It meant that I, I felt that I could no longer rely on John, the Gospel of John, to give me the teaching of Jesus, the true historical, as it happened, as it really happened, teaching of Jesus. I felt that the experts, the historians, as I say, vast majority of whom are Christians, had taken the Gospel away from me and I could hmm. no longer rely on it as reliable, as authentic. So that was... Uh, that was unfortunate. Um, now, there are other issues. I'm not going to go into them. But what they did was they, uh, the, 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 uh, the edifice of my Christian faith began to crack. And uh, the foundation, you know, basically started to crumble. Um, and my faith started to fall over. Uh, now, this is at the same time, of course, as a, being a believing Christian and believing all these doctrines of the inerrancy of Scripture, the deity of Christ, the atonement the incarnation the trinity father son holy spirit and all that perfection of the bible and i was discovering the bible was very imperfect that it contained errors and in fact some of the things i took as history and as true were perhaps not really history or true at least in terms of something that could be traced back to jesus so um i became increasingly schizophrenic if that's the right word on the one hand i was a went to church i believed i prayed on the other hand my faith was in crisis and it wasn't getting any better it was getting worse and worse and worse and i did study uh this at university uh as well and uh which didn't um help in some ways my faith my conservative faith but that's another story i'm not going to go into that so just want to share with you um some words from uh this book jesus now and then by Richard A. Burridge and Graham Gould. Now, Richard Burridge, uh, as I say, is Dean of King's College, one of the great theological colleges in Britain. Uh, he's professor of biblical interpretation. He's um, also a Church of England priest. He's a believing Christian. Uh, and he wrote this book with Gould, who is um, a lecturer also at King's College in Patristics, that is the early fathers. So they co-wrote this book. And I do recommend it, actually. You can get it uh, via Amazon and so on. And um, this is what they say. Um, and I have no reason to disagree with this. Uh, I, but I want to share with you 
give you a flavour of how serious Christian committed top-notch biblical scholars and experts understand the historical basis for their Christian faith and the problems they see. They see this uh, and, and uh, you know, these are not enemies of Christianity. So uh, this is page 195. They write, to modern eyes, it is almost in inevitable that theologians, that the theologians of the early church will appear to have read scripture in a very naive way when they took it as evidence that Jesus was a divine person, become human, in other words, the incarnation. They took what to us seem like very vague hints in the Old Testament about the figure of the Messiah or the figure of wisdom, a personified quality of God in the Old Testament, notably the book of Proverbs, and interpreted these as evidence that the Old Testament authors actually foresaw in considerable detail the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. So what they're saying here is that these early theologians of the church, you know, the bishops, uh, you know, whether it be Origen or Arrhenaeus or Tertullian or Justin Martyr, uh, quite, quite a few of these very well-known names, they mined the Old Testament for um, hints or evidence or proofs about the coming of Jesus, God on earth, the Messiah, the incarnation. Um, and alongside this prophetic proof of Jesus' status as God's son or Messiah, which is expanded, he says, for example, in the works of Justin and Origen, the church fathers set a range of information about him, his miracles, his teaching, his authority over demons and his power to forgive sins, and erected it into what to them was very clear proof that he was a divine being. Even then they were not finished, for they took the New Testament hints about Jesus' pre-existence, for example in Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15, and the Gospel of John, 1, 1, and developed them with the aid of the Logos doctrine of, of Middle Platonist philosophy into the fully-fledged doctrine of Jesus as God's creative Logos, which in the second century became the basis of of the doctrines of the Trinity and Incarnation. Now this is heavy historical theology. I'm not necessarily going to unpack it all here. It needs to say that the doctrine of the Trinity did not exist in the first century or the second century. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what predominated, I remember studying this at university, was this Logos theology in the second century. Logos is the Greek word meaning word, word. or reason. And it was identified as Jesus. This doctrine is heavily influenced by pagan philosophy, i.e. Plato's ideas, the, the Greek philosopher from the 5th century BC. They continue, modern readers of the Bible know much more than the writers of the early church could possibly have done about the type of literature that is contained in the Bible, about the nature of metaphor, about the way in which beliefs about the Messiah accumulated and the way in which Christian beliefs about Jesus developed over time, including the period of the New Testament itself. So they're saying here that today, because of our awareness and sensitivity of genre, that's the sense of the different kinds of literature that exist, so we have to ask what kind of literature is this? Is it poetry? Is it a metaphor? Is it history? Is it a letter? Is it meant to be taken as... Uh, unvarnished reporting or is it highly interpreted and so on and so on we're now much more sensitive to these issues they say than the early fathers were and also the sense that the understanding of Jesus in the early church developed and changed it wasn't static from the beginning so they continue we are aware of how the New Testament presentation of Jesus was shaped by beliefs about him so that it cannot be used as a purely objective historical evidence hmm. for his life and status. So they're saying here, this is a commonplace in scholarship, that the beliefs of the writers, say of the Gospels, the beliefs that they had, shaped the way they spoke about Jesus. So the Gospels tell us as much really about the author's beliefs about Jesus as they do about Jesus out there as a person who they are describing. 
So they're not objective in the modern sense of being disinterested uh, accounts of a life. They are motivated by faith. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be aware of that when we read these texts and not just assume, perhaps naively, that they are giving us objective truth. So they continue and they give an example. For example, we know that some of the gospel statements that Jesus fulfilled prophecy and the events in his life that are alleged to have done so were probably created in the light of the belief that he was the Messiah and cannot be used as evidence to support the belief. For example, their example is the story of Jesus' flight into Egypt in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Now, without going into all of what they're getting at here, uh, but I'll just very briefly mention for Matthew, it is commonly accepted, is presenting Jesus as a new Moses, as a second Moses. And so the gospel portrays Jesus in that way. So, uh, of course, who was it that gave a sermon uh, uh, that, that addressed Israel on Mount Sinai? Well, it was Moses. Who was it that addressed the crowds on the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it was the second Moses, Jesus. Who was it that went, uh, uh, who came out of Egypt uh, in the Exodus? That was Moses. Who came out of Egypt? It was Jesus. And there's so many parallels between Moses and Jesus and Moses and Jesus, which are uniquely found in this gospel. No other gospel, Luke, for example, does not have uh, Jesus going off to Egypt. Um, and this is, a, this he, he says, uh, these um, stories, well, the story of Jesus' flight into Egypt and then out of Egypt, again, uh, are probably created, they say, in the light of the belief that he was the Messiah and, but they don't say it, but a second Moses. So they continue, unless modern Christians are going to, to pretend that they live in the second or fourth century and to take scripture exactly as it was taken by the tradition prior to the Enlightenment, it is difficult to accept that there is as much historical basis in scripture for believing that Jesus was divine as the early church commonly thought. For this reason alone, the liberal project of refusing to be too dogmatic about claiming that Jesus was divine seems amply justified. Now, this extract is part of a, a chapter which is talking about modern understandings of Jesus. And it's talking about how the liberal understanding of Jesus actually can help us to uh, sort out fact from fiction in the Gospels. Um, so I, I leave that there. But you, you see how... Uh, how dangerous this is if you are a fundamentalist Christian because it really brings you up against the question of the historical uh, or unhistorical nature of the Gospels in the light of an intelligent critical understanding of the texts and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So just to end it really here because I could go on and on and on for hours like this, um, a lot of what I believed as a Christian I still believe. Uh, as I said, the iceberg is there. Vast areas of belief I still hold. In fact, most of what I believe, I still believe. But on certain crucial doctrines, crucial beliefs, I don't. I don't believe Jesus was Yahweh. Um, I don't believe it, that he was the incarnate son of God. I don't believe he was the second person of the Trinity. And, I, and the idea of atonement, this idea of a human sacrifice or, or of, of any kind is necessary for God to forgive us. And reconcile us I think is totally unacceptable uh, on historical and moral and theological grounds so I reject that now uh, and I have obviously for some time so that's why I'm no longer a Christian but I suppose you could say I'm still half a Christian and I, I, what I mean by that is I, I the good things in Christianity I accept the things I no longer believe in I don't accept obviously hmm. um, so that's for what it's worth my story and I must say that there are many many people who can give a similar story. Uh, I, I know that the people who were with me in the first year class at university when I started to study Christianity, a Bachelor of Divinity degree at uh, University of London, I think most of us were conservative Christians, evangelicals, probably more and more Catholics as well. And I believe, I'm told, uh, that by the end of the course, uh, only one person was still evangelical or traditional at all and even they were quite liberal because we'd all been forced to face the facts the historical facts the literary facts the archaeology uh the facts uh, of uh of biblical scholarship what they have uncovered and shown us uh, about 
the scriptures and about historical theology, about the historical Jesus, about, well, you name it, it's a very long list. And um, that's why um, many of us, well, some of us lost our faith, some of us <clears> clung <throat> to bits of it. Um, anyway, but so there we go. That's why I'm no longer a Christian. Well, got a reaccount um, of his experience. Until next time. Assalamu alaikum! family, welcome back to the channel. It's your boy, Mr. Watoa. Today, today, today. Hey, yo. Scratch, scratch, man. Check this out. It's your boy, Mr. Watoa. <laughs> okay. And I got a nice video All for right. you. Because everyone's been asking me, why did you convert to Islam? What was the reasons, Mr. Watoa? Please tell me. Well, I'm about to tell you right now. Hope you guys are ready. Now, remember, if this is your first time on the channel, make sure you go ahead and subscribe and join the Watoa family. Also, before we get started, start it. Put a like on this video. Remember, if you got a beer woman react to, get down in the comment section, post the link, and I will get to it. All right, so let's go ahead and go with this. Now, mind you guys, these are not in order. They're not, you know, from the most important to the least important. It's just five reasons why I chose to convert to Islam. Now, let's go ahead and get into it. Hold on. Before we get into it, let me say one thing. My background, my religion before I was Catholic. I was a Roman Catholic. I came from a Nigerian Roman Catholic family. So I grew up as a Nigerian Roman Catholic. <laughs> I was born in Nigeria. Then from Nigeria, uh, we came over here and um, I've been living you know, in America, of course, going back and forth from Nigeria and America, but I've been living in America since. So I guess you could say I am a Nigerian US living Roman Catholic at that time, you know, before I converted to Islam. Now life as a Catholic, as a sense was, uh, it was, it was easy in a sense. Um, just going, going to church, uh, of course, getting baptized, going to, you know, church school. Uh, and that was basically it, you know, um, of course, you know, learning the prayers. And then, yeah, that was basically it. You know, that was basically it, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, there was nothing <laughs> else after that. So five reasons why I chose to convert to Islam. Number five. Hmm. The reason why I chose to convert to Islam is because God has no God. That was one thing that I had to understand that I cannot look at someone and basically a, a person or a messenger or a imam or a priest or anyone and and say that they're God as well because they're bringing you know the word from God in a sense so that was one of the reasons why I chose Islam because in Islam you know they don't worship any you know prophets they don't call any prophets God as well they don't call any prophets the son of God so that was very important to me when I started thinking about it like hmm. Why am I praying to Jesus as a guy? It says in the Bible that God said if you pray through Jesus that, you know, it will be answered. But I don't think calling him the son of God, you know, uh, calling Mother Maryam the mother of God, that was all confusing. Plus the sign of the cross. It was just a lot going on. So that was one of the reasons why with this lamb, they don't do that. That was a big factor for me. Number four. <laughs> Number four, not worshiping any creation from God. So not worshiping anything that was created by God. So not worshiping a rock or not worshiping a animal or not worshiping a tree or not worshiping, you know, things that was created by God, not worshiping those things as, as far as like aligning them with God in a sense. So that was another thing because, you know, I've studied other religions and a lot of other religions take like different, you know, items or things on earth and you know worship is God as well and to me that was a little bit like out of here in a sense it wasn't too much like recollecting with me as far as like making me comfortable in a sense that okay is that right to be you know worshiping this rock or worshiping this animal as if they're God and praying to this animal or this rock or this inanimate object or you know just things on earth like why these are all creations from God so why am I worshiping it Number three, the other reason why is because I've seen that how close family is. And when I say mm. family, it's not necessarily your initial immediate family. I'm talking about the, the ummah in a sense. Like the community, family, the Muslim community. Being in a Muslim like environment, the way mm. that when you walk to another Muslim brother, 
they call you brother. When you walk to a, a, a Muslim, uh, you know, a Muslim woman, you know, you call her sister. She's going to call you brother, you know, for me because I'm a man. So they're going to call you brother just like you would call them brother or sister. And they will take you in with open arms. Like, guys, I'm going to tell you all right now, there has not been a time where I needed advice or I needed help with something. And I wasn't able to call one of my Muslim brothers and sisters and they was there on a stack, not wanting anything in return, not saying, oh, OK, well, if I do this for you, can you do this for me kind of thing? Like it was more so, yeah, let me do that because that's what Islam teaches. Islam teaches that like, you know, to help one another and basically not don't you know, don't worry about nothing in return because at the end of the day, that is all a part of your deeds. That is all a part of the things that you're going to take with you when it's time to answer a lie. So I started thinking about it like, man, you know, like this is, this is something, this is something different. Like the Ummah is just, wow. You know, and then honestly, guys, this was even before I even took my Shahada. I was already amongst a lot of Muslim people and I was already feeling the brotherhood. And mind you guys, I was still a Christian at that time. And it was a lot of love at that time. Like, you know, just helping me with things. And, and just being there for me. And I was just sitting there like, man, I, I ain't never experienced this. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and it was different to me. So I was like, wow, you know, I really want to embrace this. And, you know, the day that I took my uh, Shahada, you know what I'm saying? Like I got it posted on YouTube. The day I took my Shahada, it was, it was, it was such a, a bliss. And when I say a bliss, I mean, it was just so free. You know what I'm saying? Like it was no stress. I felt less stress. It was, it wasn't even that difficult in a sense because I think I was already Muslim in my heart so it was just hmm. like yo i just need to go ahead and let the world know that you know mr watwa is a muslim now so it was just it was great man it was it was a, it was a very beautiful experience you know <laughs> that was lit man number two praying i mean the way that we muslims pray is so beautiful. I'm trying to tell y'all, like, just to be able to say Bismillah and be able to pray with your brothers, you know what I'm saying, shoulder to shoulder, being at the mosque, like that kind of prayer is different. Like, you know, when I was in the Catholic church, it was more so you're sitting in a chair, you get up, you sit back down, you get up, you recite a couple of things, you sit back down, then you get on your, you know, you get on your knees, you pray, then you get back up and then it's time to hear the word from the priest. And then after you hear the word from the priest, then it's time to uh, drink the blood of Jesus and eat the body of the son, which is Jesus, eat the body of the Jesus. And then after that, it's time to go. Like, you know, that was prayer, but going to the mosque and praying is a whole different spiritual experience. I'm talking about, yo, you are literally putting your hands, hands down first. As you get down on your knees, hand down first and you come in with your nose. I mean, head forward, everything. It's just like, it's a different kind of prayer. And it's, you feel so great afterwards. Like after you're done praying, you feel so great. Every Every time I go to the mosque and I pray, as soon as I'm done praying, it is very difficult. When I say difficult, it's very difficult for me to just get up and go. No, like it's like I want to sit there and literally just run through everything that I've been stressed out about, everything that's been a blessing, because that's the things that I also say thank you for. I say thank you for, you know, the blessings as well. You know, I just think a lot, man. I'm like, a, you know, a lot. Like, I don't know why I'm in this position, but I just want to thank you. And then, you know, I also talk about, you know, certain maybe stresses I'm going through or certain, you know, things that are going on in my life. You know, I, I whether ask a lot for forgiveness or I ask a lot to help me and guide me, you know. And then after that, it's like, I just sit there and I just try to, and, and it's it's so simple, guys. It's, it's literally so simple. When you're at the mosque and you're sitting down with your legs, you know, folded, everything becomes Quiet. I mean, hmm. there could be other people in the mosque. Everything becomes quiet, and you're literally zoned, listening. Whoa, really? You're literally just listening. And 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 some people would say, "Well, what are you listening for, Mr. Watwa?" And honestly, guys, I'm listening for the angels that be around me that are just saying, "Yo, Mr. Watwa, keep going." You know, the angels that protect you, Mr. Watwa, keep going. You're doing great. You are doing great. Keep going. No matter if you feel like you're not, keep going, you know, and never quit. You know, Allah is watching and Allah is proud. And those are the things that I be sitting there and I just be like, Woo! It's time to get up and go, you know? <laughs> Yo, man, that was wow. Alhamdulillah. Okay. And number one, I know you guys are like, what is number one? But remember I told you at the beginning that they're not in order, so one is more yeah. than the other one. But the number one thing is that made me, you know why I decided to convert to Islam is because I want to die as a Muslim. You know, I really feel that in my heart that 
being a Muslim and dying as a Muslim, to me, is going to make me more closer to my deen. It's also going to make me be able to take my deeds with me because once you become Muslim, you really don't think about material things anymore. You don't think about having the best, like, as far as like, oh, well, I'm trying to impress my peers in a sense, so I need to go get this. You, you, I'm not even thinking about that. Like, that stuff literally left my mind right now. I'm literally thinking about the deeds that I can do, the deeds that I can do and take with me. So when Allah is asking me, what are the things that I did on this earth, in this dunya that we're living in right now, what did I do? I'm able to let him know my deeds can speak for me. So I can go to that place, Jannah. That's where we're all trying to go. We're trying to go to Jannah. That's number one, as far as out of five, that's number one. I want to die as a Muslim. And I just thank Allah, man, Alhamdulillah, man, that I am Muslim. And honestly, guys, if I go today, I don't want no one to cry, okay? If I was to go today, I don't want no one, I don't want no one to cry because I became a Muslim and I died as a Muslim and I did a, a, as much deeds as I can. <laughs> and honestly, guys, it was a lost plan and I accomplished as much as I can. But if I continue on, if I wake up tomorrow and I get another breath, then that means I get another day to continue my deeds and continue my prayers and continue getting close to Allah and continue that oneness. You know what I'm saying? Inshallah, I mean, I mean, I mean. So yeah, guys, that's the five reasons, man. Five reasons why I became Muslim, why I converted to Islam. So with Twa family, get down in the comment section. Let me know five reasons why you converted to Islam. And also, if you are a part of another religion, please let me know the five reasons why you're a part of that religion because I will be in the comment section reading all of you guys' comments. And I hope, inshallah, I will see you guys tomorrow. So please give my salams to your family and friends. And inshallah, guys, we will make it to Jinnah. All of us, everyone in the Twa family will make it to Jinnah, inshallah. I lie, I mean, I mean, I mean. All right, guys, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Please take care. Mwah! Stay safe. Glad you could join me once again on the show. The video you're about to watch now contains very privileged information about not just Christianity, but religion in general. The information is, is a first hand experience I had as a Catholic seminarian in Hungary and a major contributor to my decision to leave the Catholic Church. Okay. I'm not making this video as a means to criticize the Catholic Church itself, but to call to mind the evil some top members of the Church's hierarchy have you know, instituted basically in the seminaries. Now, I understand that majority of you watching this video now profess the Islamic faith. That's why explaining the position of a priest would be instrumental in grasping the nucleus of my confession today. The priest in the Catholic Church is not like the Imam in a regular mosque. The priest does not preside in the church, but sits as a representative of Christ Jesus, who in every Catholic and Orthodox mass offers himself in an unblemished manner to his father, thus renewing the everlasting covenants with the world. The priest assumes the place of Jesus in a mystical format that makes it practically possible to ordain men of extremely great character to the priesthood. The priest offers the sacrifice, presents the meal, forgives sin in the name of God, and blesses. He was ordained to be a king, prophet, and a priest of the holy people of God. So because of this, the church places high premium on training the priest. The institutionalization of this came especially with the reform of uh, St. Charles Borromeo, who or where priests needed to study for years to qualify for ordinations. But in recent times, particularly after the Second Vatican Council, when liberalism took over the church, it seemed there was a surge of gay admission into the Catholic seminaries all over the world, especially in the West. Okay. Some gay priests intentionally recruited their fellow gay boys and then systematically institutionalized homosexuality in the priesthood. In fact, the Catholic priesthood today is the most thriving gay profession in the world, according to Western media. The most pathetic is that these guys 
from gay cabals in the seminary threaten mainly straight guys who stand against evil. It was on the page of these straight guys that I found myself in the seminary and I was seriously threatened coming from a very conservative, you know, Christian background. It was shocking to me when I met that in the seminary. If you dare report any of the playboys to the authority, you'll be sent home. That was the state of affair in many of the contemporary seminaries today, from Hungary to America. I was frustrated. I lost my faith in the seminary. I recited prayers, but were in vain for me as far as I was consigned. I lost hope in God and became an apostate even in the seminary. It was a very, very terrible experience. Did I also say that I started seeing everybody as hypocrites, from the Pope to my local ordinary, I mean oh. the bishop? Perhaps just listen to this particular American Christian reform advocate as he captured it succinctly. Okay, we're watching another video within a video. Hello everyone and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris. The church in America is on the road to oblivion, save some small pockets of faithful here and there. All that said, there is one particularly galling aspect of all of this which lands squarely at the feet of the bishops. For these vindictive queens, it's always someone else's fault. It's the blame game, specifically bishops blaming everyone else, meaning priests and laity, and of course exempting themselves from any responsibility whatsoever. For example, the Archbishop of Dubuque, Michael Jekylls, recently issued a letter with the very strong suggestion that his taking an ax to parishes is essentially the fault of the laity. Speaking of any given parish, he says, parishioners have decided it should be closed. Don't blame the old fat and bald bishop, he says. That statement is as deceptive as the lies from Satan. Yes, it's true that the number of practicing Catholics is declining, actually in free fall, and yes, it's true there are far fewer priests than are required, but what the caustic archbishop deliberately leaves out of his missive is this simple fact. Both those facts are true directly because of the gaying of the priesthood for the past the half century. Gaying. Regarding the Never heard that term shortage, before. the question needs to be asked, why? Simple. There are fewer priests because good men were turned away and active homosexuals let in. That, in a nutshell, is the entire crux of the problem. Over the decades, those gays, many of them active, have ascended the heights of the hierarchy and wiped out the faith in the pews. They deliberately, little by little at first, chipped away at the moral teachings of the church, in the confessional, in homilies, in schools, in seminaries, everywhere, like a swarm of termites eating away slowly at the foundation until the collapse became imminent. Along the way, the homosexuals in the clerical ranks prevented good men from getting in. And by good men, we mean masculine role models who displayed a passion for truth. These types of men tend to draw other good men into the same cause. But the opposite is also true. Weak, emasculated, feminine men are a turnoff to masculine males because they are a draw to those like them and hence the priesthood, as multiple secular media outlets have reported, has become a gay profession. But it's not just mm. the priesthood, it's also the episcopate. About 15 years ago, former priest Richard Seip, who helped the Boston Globe expose the scandal of sexual abuse of minors in 2002, compiled a list of numerous bishops he said were or are homosexual. Before presenting the list of prominent American homosexual bishops and cardinals, he pointed out, quote, each name has been closely vetted because on some, usually public facts that can be lead to a reasonable opinion. Of the 44 bishops or archbishops he named, 36 of them, he says, are homosexual. In the 15 years that have passed, it's clear that his list is pretty much spot on. And most of the big name cardinals in the church in the US are on his list. McCarrick, Wilton Gregory, Francis Spellman, Joseph Bernadine, John Quinn, Robert Brom, and on and on. Of course, in the time since he developed his list, many more names have emerged which should also be added, like Michael Bransfield of, Char of Charleston Wheeling, West Virginia, along with John Neinstedt. And of course, 
These gays make sure they are reproduced and maintain control by determining who gets accepted into seminary, especially the North American College in Rome, who gets ordained and who gets recommended to become a bishop. It's insidious and frankly demonic. Immoral hmm. men are getting into oh. seminaries. There they develop romantic sexual relationships and move into the priesthood and then cover for each other. Those that move on to be bishops, and they are legion, are particularly careful because it's left to them to cover up for priests who get <clears throat> discovered, like Bishop William Callahan of La Crosse, Wisconsin, covering up to this day for Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell, also known as Monsignor Grinder. That has been the situation in various seminaries across Europe. And perhaps it's quite sad that the church has done nothing, absolutely nothing to redeem its image before the world. The worst is that the gay mafia like cover up is active in the Catholic Church. Pope John Paul II is not supposed to be a Catholic saint today for knowing about the infested hierarchy in America and did nothing, absolutely nothing about it. He made some of the gay pioneer bishops cardinals and, ele and, and, and elevated them further in the hierarchy into positions of power that enabled them to keep the status quo. Folks, until the right change happens, Islam remains the only viable option for everyone now. Mm. I know Christians would Big actually stop my channel to deal with me by saying that I'm not being honest or sincere. But that's the truth. We have to follow the fact the way it is right now. Islam is the only viable option where modesty and stability is holding sway. Well, until. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. I'm Aisha Rosalie. Today, I have a very emotional video for you guys. It's going to be amazing. It's by a sister called Muslim Brooklyn. Um, hmm. I've been following her for a while and she made an amazing video i've seen a tiny bit of it but i stopped watching it because i wanted to watch the full thing with you guys but i can see that it's very emotional and there's going to be a lot of inspiration from this inshallah but let's go for it bismillah my name is brooklyn and i converted from christianity to islam almost a year ago to the day i found the truth God showed me the truth. Allah showed me the truth. Jesus Christ is not God. Peace be upon him. Jesus, beloved son of Mary, he is the Messiah. He will return and we do believe Jesus. We know Jesus, we love Jesus, but he is not God. God is not a trinity. God is only one. And if you knew what I knew, then you would believe too. Please pray for guidance. Salam alaikum. Hmm. Wow. Okay, wow. that was short, but it was very emotional. Wow, mashallah. You can see the emotion in her. I mean, I didn't come from Christianity, so I don't know this feeling exactly, but I can see how how much i guess i guess um how she feels lied to how she feels denied i mean i felt like that when i first became muslim i felt like i was denied by my schooling by my she atheist? You know, 18 years of hmm. education until you go into university world and stuff i was denied any islamic knowledge i honestly didn't know anything about the religion and you can feel like you were tricked for a long time. Like everyone was trying to keep this secret away from you. And that's what it feels like when you become Muslim and when you actually start learning about the religion and praying and being Muslim and you, you feel like there was a secret that everyone hid from you that no one told you and you feel betrayed in a way, but we're not betrayed. It's just that nobody knows. People who are not Muslim don't know. They don't know anything about the religion. They don't know the beauty we have in our religion. And they don't know that there's other options out there. She still loves Jesus, peace be upon him. You can see she loves Jesus. Of course you can. But she loves him for what he is. And that's not a God. 
because we have God, we have one God, God that created all of us. And I think, I think it's a really negative trait that we have as humans, where we try and turn other humans into gods. Hmm. People do it all the time, not just in Christianity and other religions right. as well. And sometimes even people in Islam, they start turning like sheikhs and scholars into like gods and worshipping and it's stuck for a lot. I'm so happy that Allah guided her and she's doing all this stuff on social media, mashallah. Make sure you follow her. Seriously, uh, alhamdulillah. Hmm. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys again soon, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum.